so, so much better. I promise you, I have had the best time talking to our next guest. He's such a legend. He really, he doesn't need any introduction. Please welcome to the stage, Alice Cooper! shows since, uh, well, I was on our tour and then I went on the Vampires tour. Yeah. Johnny, and then back on our tour and then back well with Johnny again and, and the guys. So I've been out for about five, six months without a break. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, you're at the stage in your career where you could just be coasting along and basically, it's you know. No fun. Yeah, just it's do another one. So what, what keeps you going? And also, let's talk about the Vampire Band, the Hollywood Vampires. Yeah, the Vampires are great. You know, it's, uh, yeah. you've got a, a Joe Perry plays lead guitar with us. Joe Perry takes guitar lessons from Johnny. That's how good Johnny is. I mean, Johnny's a great guitar player. People are really shocked when they hear him play. Wow. Yeah, but he would rather do that. You know, he's, he calls acting his day job. Oh, really? I, I tell, I say, yeah, but he, they pay him pretty good, don't they? Doing that acting thing, this whole acting thing. Yeah, he, but he loves guitar. He's a killer guitar player. So whose idea was The Hollywood Vampires? It was, I was, we were doing Dark no, Shadows. This went down. We were doing Dark Shadows. And uh -huh. we were talking about the Hollywood Vampires, the drinking club, which was the guys that we would, every night we'd end up at the Rainbow. And it was like Keith Moon and John Lennon and, you know, all the guys that drank ended up at the, and, and nobody ever saw us during the day. They only saw us at night, so they called us the Hollywood Vampires. And I was telling them all about this. And we decided it was a great idea to, to put a, a band together to honor all of our dead drunk friends. You know, oh. Harry Nelson and you know, all these guys. And as soon as I said that, Joe Perry walked in and says, I'm in. <laughs> Duff McKagan comes in, I'm in. You know, and, and pretty soon everybody was in this band and the band was great. The band was really, and we got to do T-Rex and you know, all these songs that were like, uh, so much fun to do on stage anyways and for us every good band was a bar band at some point mm -hmm. we, we we you know we did covers of the yardbirds and the who and everything guns and roses did covers of us you know everybody started out being a bar band even the beatles started out being a bar band so it was like going back and having fun just being a bar band again that is amazing. Very expensive bar band. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, by choice. <laughs> but how, that, that actually brings up a really interesting point because the music industry has changed so much yeah. over the last, you know, you could even say two decades, three yeah. decades, decade. How, how has that evolution affected someone like you who's been around, you know? I was lucky to be in that golden age when, you know, you, you would do two albums a year and the rest of the time you were touring. You know, um, and people bought albums, and you could write an album that had a storyline in it because it started and it ended with a storyline. You, you had to play the whole thing. Um, you know, I'm not against technology, but I think technology, in a, in a lot of ways, kind of hurt the business only because now people only buy songs, they don't really buy the conceptual album anymore like they used to. And tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me like all the younger bands are just wimpy. <laughs> I just, I hear these bands, you know, and they're like, Oh, I don't like oil. The environment is bad. I say, sing about your girlfriend. That's what, that's what most hit records are about. Your girlfriend. Well, but which do you think came first? The, you know, the wimpy bands nowadays or the fact that people were only purchasing that one song so you couldn't tell that story? No, I think that there was this real backlash to, to being politically correct 
Whereas we were in a very politically incorrect time. <laughs> Mel Brooks and, you know, I mean, you could say anything, about, and everybody had fun with it, you know. Uh, suddenly we got very, everybody got very introspective. Young kids did. And everybody wanted to all look alike. I mean, I'd walk into a, and there would be eight bands there that could all be in a different band. They could all be interchangeable. In, in sort of in the 70s, if the Rolling Stones walked in, you knew who they, who they were. If the, you know, any band, Guns N' Roses, if they walked in, you knew, if the Alice Cooper walked in, you knew who they were. Now they're just, there's no personality. It's like they forgot how to be rock stars. You know, you have to, you have to have a certain amount of outlaw in you to be a rock star. Absolutely. And I just, I think that's missing. There's, there's certain, a certain amount of danger missing in rock and roll right now. How do we bring it back? I don't know. You know, hopefully there's kids right now in, you know, in a garage learning rock and roll. You don't play guitar up here, you play it down here. <laughs> if you see this. That's the banjo. If you see this, then you got attitude. Rock and roll is basically attitude. And it doesn't matter if you're, you can sing Mary Had a Little Lamb, but if it's with the right attitude, it's rock and roll. Yeah. Absolutely. So what would your advice, I mean, you touched on it just a little bit, but what would your advice be to someone who's breaking into the industry? Would it be to re focus on like recording an entire album experience? No, I think it's, it's songwriting. It's in the songwriting. It's actually in the songwriting. You, nobody will ever come close to the Beatles. The Beatles were the, you know, the center of what good songwriting is about. Um, certain people will write two or three songs that are really great. They wrote 400 of those, you know. Um, the further you get away from the Beatles, generation-wise, the worse the songwriting gets. So I tell young bands, I want you to go listen to the Beatles. I want you to listen to early Rolling Stones. Listen to the Who, the Kinks, all these bands, because they wrote great songs. You know, I, I, I'll get a band that'll play me, you know, they've got green hair, and, you know, they, all, they look great and everything. And then I, I'll listen to the song and I'll go, okay, I get it, you're angry. <laughs> Where's the song though? You know, it's got a, it, 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 there's no riff there, there's a beat, and the guy yelling at me. You know, I said, well, okay, now, listen to the Beatles, listen to the Beach Boys, listen to anybody that writes real songs, and write me an angry song. You know, um, something that's really, that I can remember, that, that really makes an impression on you. They can't do it. They just, they just don't get it because they haven't been introduced to that music for so long. You know, that, that kind of, if you go back and listen to the Beatles stuff, it's almost flawless. You know? people, people do that in literature. They call back to, you know, the greats, but it's not so prevalent, you're right, in the music industry and certainly not in the music writing industry. I think in, in, in your business also, in acting, if, when you go and see a movie, it's an actor's movie, mm -hmm. let's say like uh, Gone Girl, Right. Where there wasn't a lot of CGI, there was nothing going on CGI, or I just saw a girl on a train. Mm -hmm. It's an actor's movie. And you go, wow, that was really good. And Emily Blunt killed me on that. Why? Because, well, she didn't, wasn't, wasn't flying around. I love CGI movies. Mm -hmm. Doctor Strange. If you're going to see Ooh. that, see it on IMAX 3D. It's incredible. Benedict is crazy good in that. He's really good. But then I also like to see a movie that where it's an actor's movie, where you really see an actor at their craft, really being really good at it. You know. Absolutely, and that translates to music. So, where you you have another passion other than music? Everyone knows you love golf, um, yeah, which is just so opposite of Alice. <laughs> Alice hates golf. Alice Cooper hates golf, but I like it. So. But I absolutely love that you have that in your life, and I want to know how you discovered the sport and, and you know, sort of your experience with it. It, it, well, it was weird. I stopped drinking uh, at 35 years ago. And when I stopped Congratulations. drinking... Congratulations. Well, you get up in the morning and throw up blood, but it might be, you know, an indication that something's wrong. Uh, and... You know, I figured that I had an addictive personality. I was always going to have an addictive personality. So find something addictive that is not going to kill me. You know, my wife and I have been married 40 years. Um, 
you know, it's one of those things where when I get into something, I really, you know, I'm one of the good guys that didn't cheat, cheating, you know, one wife, and that's good. But my career's like that, you know, I addicted to Alice Cooper a little bit, you know, to the point where I really like playing Alice Cooper. But if I get into anything that's negative on a level of physically negative, it could, it could easily kill me. So I have to stay away from any kind of outside, you know. So I was a good baseball player, and I figured, how hard could golf be? <laughs> put a ball down, you hit it. What's the hard part? So I went up to the golf course, and the guy put the ball down, and I took the club back and hit it dead down the middle, right down the middle. And he says, oh, so how long have you been playing? I said, about a minute. <laughs> and he says, well, you're a natural. And so I, I, was, I was a natural. That, it's such an amazing sport, and, and one you can play it has such longevity. Forever. Yeah. yeah. And, and the funny thing is, the guys that play, what I call the closet golfers, Iggy Pop, <laughs> Lou Reed. Lou Reed and I used to live at the Chelsea Hotel during the very bad old days. And the last time I saw Lou Reed, I said, Lou, how are you doing? Oh, man, great good to see you. I'm pushing the ball right, though. He said, I don't understand why I'm here. And I went, so would we have been having this conversation 20 years yeah. ago? Like, times have changed. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Well, so so there are a lot of guys that were addicts and that were alcoholics that stopped. It's really easy to get addicted to golf. It's very addictive. So, I mean, I, got, I play six days a week. I play almost every day. That's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's great, and you obviously are very good at it. So. Well, I'm a four handicap now. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, let's rewind a little bit. You said you really enjoyed the Alice Cooper persona and, and still do. Yeah. How did you create that persona? It was a matter of, uh, it was actually a matter of, I, went, I would go to see The Who, and I'd go, these guys are so good. Pete Townsend, unbelievable. Still to this day, the spirit of rock and roll is in embodied in Pete Townsend. He still plays, his knuckles are still bleeding. The windmill thing and all that. I mean, he still got it. Um, and I went, but what I would see there was an empty canvas behind them. Every band that was up there was really good, but there was just nothing else going on. And to me, let's make these lyrics come to life. If you're gonna say welcome to my nightmare, give them the nightmare. Don't just say it. You know, give them the nightmare. You can, you can, you can play the song and play it great. It's that's the cake, but the theatrics is the icing on the cake. And we just always felt that that was really important. Make the song come alive. And rock and roll was full of Peter Pan's and no Captain Hook. You know, and I just went, I will gladly be Captain Hook. <laughs> I love that analogy. But it really was. There was no. There was no villain in the rock and roll. Well, especially in that era that you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, there really wasn't. Everybody was a hero. Everybody yeah. was a rock and roll hero. And I went, I would much rather be the villain, you know, <laughs> in rock and roll. And there wasn't a definitive villain. So I made Alice the definitive villain. And I, I actually told this to, to Betty Davis when she was alive and to Jane Fonda. And I said this you have a lot to do with, with Alice Cooper. And they go, what? what? And I said, well, I'm, when I'm designing the character of Alice Cooper, I saw Barbarella, right? Uh -huh. And I saw the Black Queen, you know, uh, Anita Pellenberg. Uh -huh. And she was all in black leather, and she kind of went like that, and switch blades came out of her wrist, and I went, oh, yeah. That's Alice right there. And then I saw whatever happened to Baby Jane. Betty Davis had this caked up makeup on and her lipsticks was all smeared and her eyes were not right at all and it was all cracking and she's trying to be an eight-year-old girl. Uh -huh. And I went, that's all of, all, also Alice Cooper. Let's combine those two. And that's I kind of that. where I got the idea of the look of Alice. Uh, and so now tell us about the first time you went full on Alice, full on show, you know, with the the dramatic. It was know. always like that. It okay. was always, you know, we always had the the, the the theatrical look, but when we actually, I, I think maybe the breakthrough was we played um, a place called the Cheetah, and it was uh, Lenny Bruce's birthday party. The Doors, all these bands were there in Los Angeles, and everybody was groovy, you know. 
everybody was on LSD and they were all, all the world's a great place. And we came on. <laughs> and we had up lighting. And we looked like, kind of looked like Tim Curry and It. You know? <laughs> and it was like very distorted. And we started out with, you know, this song called uh, Out in the Street by the Movie. It was like springtime for Hitler. Was like, you know, <laughs> the audience was. We cleared the room in two songs. <laughs> Six thousand people running for the doors because they were trying to get out of the room. There were three people left. It was Frank Zappa, <laughs> uh, Chef Gordon, my manager, who wasn't my manager at the time, and some of the GTOs. Yeah, and Frank Zappa folks. I gotta have this man, you know. Anybody that can clear a room that quick, because we terrified them. I mean, they were, everybody was all grooving to the, you know, the nice vibes, and we were just like, the most horrific thing you've ever seen up there. And we meant it. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like we were just playing this, we were literally, it was a visual attack on the audience. And it was twice as loud as anybody else, and you could see that the band meant it. And that's what scared them, was that, that you know, we were sort of like, <laughs> probably still people having nightmares. When we used to do, when we used to do festivals, it would be Santana, Jefferson Airplane, you know, <laughs> these wonderful acts, you know, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. And then they would say, um, in three hours, Alice Cooper's coming on. All of those on the brown acid, please report to the... <laughs> and they would actually do a, you know, do a warning that we were coming on. Oh Be my god! Because gosh. anybody that was on LSD, you know, they were telling them, this isn't a good thing for you right now. You know? You're gonna wanna relocate. Yes. <laughs> you have so, three hours to do we so. Were, we were the only band with a disclaimer, which was, was great. <laughs> we love that, we love that. I love that. I, I mean, I am having so much fun just sitting here talking to you. I know you guys have questions, too. Um, there's two mics. Um, We've so, already discussed no math. Yeah, no math questions. We're all field the math questions right. for you. But if you would like to ask a question, go ahead and line up at the mics. And while they're lining up, um, Vinyl, the HBO show, you were, there was a character, you know, an Alice Cooper character. And I was wondering how you did, you know, HBO contact you and, and, and request that they write no, you was, in? They were very nice. You know, they, I, I got a script from uh, Mick Jagger and Scorsese. And they actually said, here's the script. Is there anything in here you disapprove of? You know, and it's all, it was all fiction anyways. It wasn't based on anything real. The times were real. Right. The way it worked was real, but they weren't real stories. And that never really happened, what happened with the Alice Cooper thing. I said, if you want the character to be correct, I used to drink whiskey all day, okay? But I never slurred a word, I never stumbled, I never missed a show. You know, I mean, I was one of those guys that could drink all day and just, you'd never know it. Mm -hmm. So if your character's gonna be drinking, make sure he doesn't look drunk. Right. And they said, okay. And I said, and I never swore. Mm -hmm. The Alice character never swore. I said, so, and they got that. They got that really correct with the, with the thing. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was phenomenal. I was a huge fan of that show to begin with. I, Andrew Dice Clay stole the, the show for me. He, oh, yeah. He, he was unbelievable in that show. He was, he was really good in that. And they killed him too soon in the show. They did kill him yeah. too soon. They, and they killed the show too soon. I'm yeah, really I bummed thought, it's not coming back. You didn't have a chance to get behind anybody yet. Yeah. You know, you were starting to just get behind this guy and then, you know, and then it passed him. It's too bad. Yeah. HBO, bring it back. Yes, let's start right here. Hi, right, first off, uh, go Toros. And, <laughs> yeah, and I guess this is the closest I would ever get to asking uh, Jim yeah. Morrison a question because I know you guys opened up for the doors. Yeah. And uh, so, what advice do you think Jim Morrison would give to to what What do you take away from him, and what advice do you think he'd have today? First of all, <laughs> Jim and I drank a little, <laughs> and uh, Robbie Craiger was telling a story one time, and I. Wow, I said, I don't remember this. We were in Denver or, or someplace, and no, in Portland, Oregon, in a theater, big theater. 
And he says, they walked in for their sound check, and Jim and I were hanging from the balcony <laughs> to see who could hang on the longest. And, and he walked in and he went, you know, my guys are trying to get me down there. And I went, I don't remember that. And, and he said, well, I was there, and that happened. So the fact that Jim Morrison died at 27, like the 27 Club, you know, and people say that's really too bad that he died that early. And I went, the fact that he got to 27 <laughs> is a miracle. So Jim would not have given anybody any advice. He was a total free, free spirit. He was one of those guys that was truly a poet. Um, one of the most self-destructive people I'd ever met, but not on stage and not in the studio and not when he was writing. His lifestyle though was very self-destructive. And there was nobody that was ever going to talk him out of it. You know, break on through. Every song was about dying. Every song was about being on the other side. So yeah, it's not really shocking, you know, that he achieved that. But he was a great guy. Thank you. Great question. <clears throat> yes, hi. Hi. Um, I saw you 40 years ago, right here in Providence. And I saw you this past summer with Hollywood Vampires. How have you maintained such incredible energy and vibes that keep somebody like me to follow you and you're just yeah, amazing. You know, stress kills. I'm the least stressed out person on the planet. Is that because of golf? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, I, I, I avoided all the traps, you know. Uh, I, I got through my alcohol and drug thing earlier in my life. And um, I got three great kids, two grandsons that are twin grandsons. Falcon and Riot, <laughs> and they live up to it. They're two years old, and they just, they would have torn this place to pieces by now. One more question, do you still enjoy doing the show? I love it. As I, much? I as look them? forward to it. I, awesome. I really look forward to it every night. You haven't you know? changed. No, you know, it's, it's, being sober is a good thing because now I enjoy playing the character. You know, before it was, there's, you get to a point in your career where you go on tour, early in your career, you go on tour because you have to. You take every job in acting, yep. you take every job, because it's, that's experience and, and there's no such thing as, no, I don't want that part. Would you consider it, playing an evil pirate with Johnny? Oh yeah, I'd be a great pirate, are you kidding? I'd be a great pirate. But the thing about it is, is like, you know, um, when you get to a certain point in your career, then you start realizing you're touring because you want to, not because you have to financially or anything, you're just touring because you, if, if you, when you see the guys out there now, the Stones, they're not, they're not starving. They're touring because they're the Rolling Stones. Bob Dylan does 200 shows a year because somebody asked him one time and he says, I write songs and I sing them. That's what I do, you know? And I think that's the same with me. Uh, the, uh, the retirement word is not in my vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi. Hey, hi Alice. Um, the first rock album I ever heard was Billion Dollar Babies at probably 12, and it demented my mind forever. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, huge Guns N' Roses fans, got to get your thoughts on the recent reunion of Guns N' Roses. Great, inevitable. You know, we took them on their first tour, and uh, they were great. I mean, they were a great bar band, uh, Izzy and the original band. And every single night, they would push us. Normally, we didn't care about the first opening act. We liked it. We, we treated the first opening act like gold because we used to be an opening act, right? So I always made sure that the opening act was treated really well. These guys tore it up on stage, and I looked at my band and said, we got to be good tonight. <laughs> These guys are great, and that's good. I mean, that's always makes for a better show when you have some opening act that really pushes you. Um, later on, they just kind of went, you know, the drug thing got to them, of course. They were all doing pretty hard stuff. Uh, Axel was certainly his own person. Slash and I were very good friends, you know. Um, but the fact of them getting back together, I think, was pretty inevitable uh, because that band is great together. They, was, we, I wish Izzy was in the band, Thank you too. know. Uh, I, don't, I don't know why he isn't, but still, I understand the show's really good. Yeah, Axel, so. and you know a lot of people come to me and they say, you know, oh, Axel's singing for ACDC and blah blah blah, and I went, he's about the only one that could take that place. He's about the only one that understands that music and has the range in order. He wasn't trying to replace Brian. Brian just couldn't sing it anymore. So 
Axel's a great choice for that. Yep, yeah. I saw that show. And Axel's chilled out. I spent some time with him this summer. Yeah. Totally ch chilled yeah. out dude yeah. compared to Axel and I got along really well. You know, he was, he was a good guy. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, hi. Hi, how are you doing? Um, um, you saw me with me at the soft spot to me, and um, I heard that Frank Sinatra did a cover of it. Is that true? He did you and me. Yeah. Did yeah. I say it wrong? But it's a great story. Albert Brooks, Steve Martin, myself, the Carpenters, the Monkees, and we would play for charity. And there was this 10-year-old kid that was trying to get in and couldn't get in, and I went over and I said, I brought him in, I sat him down on the bench and gave him a hat, and he was now in. So that night, I'm walking to the casino, and this guy goes, hey, the boss wants to see you. <laughs> I'm, you know, I don't know who the boss is, but I'm not going to say no to this guy. You know? <laughs> I better hurry. And I go over and it's Frank Sinatra. What casino? And he says, and he goes, he says, say, hey, uh, hey, Coop. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, uh, you did me a solid today. He said, I owe you one. And I went, oh, Mr. Sinatra. He says, Frank. I said, Frank. He said, uh, I don't understand. He says, well, that kid was Jilly's son, and Jilly was his best friend. He says, and he says, you put him in there and you did me a solid. So two years later, I get this invitation to the Hollywood Bowl. And, you know, I thought, oh, that's a nice Frank, you know, send us tickets to the Hollywood Bowl. We'll go and see him. We're sitting there, we'll see you. Hey, yeah, the boss wants to see you. <laughs> now I know who the boss is. And I'm there with Bernie Tom, and Bernie's my best friend, you know. And Bernie and I go back there, and he's got his tie on. Got a martini in one hand and a cigarette in the other one. And he goes, I'm gonna do one of your songs tonight. <laughs> I think it spills out. <laughs> I, can't, I love the dead. I can't picture this. He says, uh, I said, he says, you and me. I said, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he, he says, you keep writing them, kid, I'll keep singing them. Oh man. All right. Yeah, suddenly, I, when I showed that picture to my mom, finally she understood that I was in show business. <laughs> me and Frank Sinatra, you know, and that I'm made legit. that talk to her. You know, but he was very cool. Frank Sinatra, was, he was really a cool guy. Thank you. That was a great question. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm an elementary music school teacher, and you've always been a huge inspiration to me. Um, <laughs> Um, I want to start a rock and roll unit with my fourth and fifth graders, but I'm not really sure what bands I should be exposing them to. So, what start with recommendations the do you start have? Start with the Beatles and the Beach Boys, because right. that's that's three minute happy songs, <laughs> and every kid can understand that. Mm -hmm. You know, they they get the idea that boy, this song, it's really very positive music, mm -hmm. very very positive. And then you know, music then became more and more artistic and more and more stretched out and prog rock and this kind of rock and that. But if you start with that, they will totally get the fact that these were great songs mm -hmm. and great singers at the same time. Exactly. And then, you know, then it'll evolve into the other bands. All right, yeah. thank you so much. Do you have a favorite Beatles album? You know, it'd be hard to pick one. They're, they're so good. Uh, Sgt. Pepper was so great, you know. One of those albums is kind of, it, it's per, Close to, close to Everything went right. Yeah. 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 The white album is awfully good though too. Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Alice. Um, so I just want to say I saw you for the first time when I was seven years old. I was watching Wayne's World, and I just saw you as a man. You turned out fine. I did. I did. <laughs> um, but so my question for you is, what's your craziest tour memory? Too crazy, what's your favorite golf story? <laughs> well, he didn't remember hanging off the uh, yeah. balcony rail with Jim Morrison. So. That was like, in, anytime you were with Keith Moon, yes. <laughs> it was like I'm truly certifiably insane. And yet, the greatest drummer I ever heard in my life. You know, I think any drummer would listen to, to what Keith Moon was playing and go, okay, this guy is beyond belief. But a day like I was telling you before, like the, the, the balcony, that would have been a Tuesday for him. <laughs> you know, he would come over to the house, and my wife and I were just married. She was 18, didn't really know any rock and rollers. 
you know, she was classically trained ballet, the whole thing. And this guy is there, this Keith Moon fellow, you know, and he would come over and stay for two weeks. <laughs> and then go over to Harry's house for two weeks and, and you know, he was like your crazy little brother. You know. And one time we came home, he opens the door and he's in a full French maid's outfit. <laughs> oh, hello, Mr. Cooper. I just the old house. Can I please take the night off? And, and my wife's going, who is this? <laughs> What's going on? You know, every day was like that for him. With the vampires, we would, we would sit, go to the rainbow, sit there, and wait to see who Keith was going to be that night. You know, he would be the Queen of England one night. He'd come in. He had, a, he had a 1929 Rolls Royce. It was almost the size of this stage. And he took all the, all the seats out and put a throne in the back. <laughs> and had the roof removed. So when he drove down Sunset Boulevard as the Queen of England, he could... Wow. And so at one point, you know, I said, Keith, Cheryl and I have got to go do a business meeting. You know, and can I come? No, no it's a business meeting. Why would you want to come? Why? You know, and he says, oh, all right. It's like a little kid, you know. And so we're driving down, you know, Cheryl's driving, you know, down Benedict Canyon, and all of a sudden you see, hello, he's on the roof. <laughs> This is two miles from my house going on. And I'm going, but this is that's two stories. There are thousands of stories like this about Keith Moon. I mean you could never capture this man's insanity. And yet the guy was the greatest drummer of all time. But one, just one more thing, because this always made me laugh so much. My parents would be in the house. And Keith would be going. Uh, Mr. Fernay, your son and I are such good friends. And, you know, he's such a swell fellow. You know, and, and this and that. Really good to be his friend. And then my dad would turn around and he'd go, <laughs> And, you know, I. <laughs> he was like a little kid that needed Ritalin, you know. But, but, you, you could ask anybody in rock and roll to tell you their Keith Moon story, and they'll tell you something every bit as good as those stories. Wow, that's <laughs> yeah. incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I think the first thing I saw you in was the movie Prince of Darkness. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you have any memories of that or John Carpenter. Yeah, well, I went down to watch them film it. They were shooting it down in Los Angeles in this old mission down there. And John said, if you want to come down, we're going to shoot tomorrow. I went, okay, great. So I went down there, and, you know, they're shooting, and I, I see that there's all these derelicts in the background, you know, standing around. And he says, hey, you know what would be funny? You put one of these hats on and just, you know, it would be like a they'd swing through it. I said, oh, that's cool. I said, okay, that'd be fun. And I put the hat on. And we showed that. And they're getting ready to shoot this one scene. He goes, you know that thing you do where you put the mic stand through the guy's chest on stage? And it comes out the other end. Yeah. He said, can we do that with a bicycle? <laughs> yeah. He said, okay, okay. And he starts setting up the scene. So now I'm in this scene. It ends up I'm in the whole movie now. You know, I went down there just to watch the thing, you know, and ended up I was there four days shooting. <laughs> because now once you're established, they can't pull you off. They don't, they don't want you to leave. <laughs> so it was, it was fun to be in the movie. John Carpenter uh, was really cool guy. I mean, still great, great guy. And he, was, he loves wrestling. His wrestling, he's a big wrestling fan. But his movies are so good. His music, he does all the music on his movies too. The Halloween theme is one of the great, great pieces. Thank you. Great question. Hi. Hello. How are you? Hi. Um, I can't hit my irons to save my life. What is the weakest part of your game? And second question, what's your go-to rescue club that's in your bag? If I were, if I could play all hybrids, I'd play all hybrids, all the way to the pitching wedge, because it's so much easier to hit. I've never been a good irons player. I was always a good driver, but I could hit fairways all day. And when they start coming out with the hybrids, I'd say keep them going. I got one with the seven iron, but I hit an eight and nine iron. But I wish they'd make an eight and nine hybrid. I'd, I'd hit all hybrids. Um, 
it, you know, uh, you know it, it's it, the game is day to day. You know, it's uh, it's when you play as much as I do, though, you get into like a sort of groove swing. So I know I'm going to shoot 76, 75 every day. You know, I mean, I almost know it. I can guarantee it. But that's just muscle memory at that point. You know, uh, not very many people. I always tell people, if you want to get in the golf, if you want to play golf, don't get in the golf business. If you want to play golf, get in the band. <laughs> because we don't work till eight o'clock at night. We have all day in, in Wichita to do nothing. You know. It's a lot of play. So play golf, we'll go play golf. Yeah. That's awesome. Great question. Thank you. Hi. Hi. My question is, with all the talent shows out there now, the singing shows and things like that, if they had asked you to be a judge, would you come on full Alice or not? I would be too nice. <laughs> you know, I mean, I sit there and then I hear all these, these singers, I go, you're all great singers. Every one of you can do a Burt Bacharach song. Great. Why don't they have a show where they write their songs? That way, if, because, think about it. If Bob Dylan came on that show, he wouldn't even get past the first rehearsal, right? <laughs> Anybody, Mick Jagger came on, he'd never get past because he's not the cookie cutter, what they're looking for. They, unfortunately, a lot of these singers end up on cruises or in lounges in casinos because pretty much, I, there's probably 20 people in here that can sing as well as any of those people, right? So what? It's great that you can sing. Now write a song and sing it. Make me believe it. But that's that's where the real talent is. I don't care what you look like. If you can make me believe it, and, and it's a it's a song that touches me, or it makes me mad, or it makes me happy, that's what real talent is. Is is really inventing a song, not just singing somebody else's song. So I kind of look at those shows and I go, you know, uh, they're all talented. And they're all great, but it's almost so what. Yeah. Thank you. So you need to call McDagger and Scorsese now that Vinyl's done, and you need to pitch this idea to them. It's you guys great, need to get yeah, it on the network. Yeah, because I mean, nobody's done that yet. Nobody's put a show on where a band goes on, writes their own song, and, and competes with that. I think it's, I, I mean, it makes total sense. I don't know why I yeah. didn't think of it. No. You did. It's your show now. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> Hi. Hi, how are you? Um, just wanted to say the first time I saw you in concert was when you opened for Iron Maiden back in 2012. It was an awesome show. Thank you. Um, one question I wanted to have is, um, as a fellow musician, I want to try to get out a little bit more and see if I can get noticed a little bit, but uh, what advice would you give to an aspiring musician? Well, if I was going to try to get noticed, I wouldn't dress like a ninja. ninja. Yeah, that's what I <laughs> So you have to know your face pretty soon, eventually. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, there's, there's really nothing. Now we're in an age where anybody can make an album in their garage. The equipment is so great. Pro Tools. I mean, you can literally make, uh, I think uh, Foo Fighters made their last album in a garage and it was number one. And it sounded great. So anybody can, can write songs now. It's a very difficult time to break in the business. My son's got a band called Co-op, and they are unbelievably good. In the 70s, they would have been, they would have been signed and had three albums out by now. I said, you're in the wrong era. Right now, I don't know where we're going, but I think we recycle, and I think we're gonna get back to, this may be something that you can capitalize on. I think we're gonna get back to the Sunset Strip, 1980. We're going to get back to the, the hair bands, the spandex bands, with a little bit of show. And if you remember, almost every one of those bands that were glammed out made great records. You know, they made really good records, and they did great shows. That was the last time rock and roll really was fun to watch. Mm -hmm. You know, so you might want to think in those, in those terms of glam rock. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Hi. Hi. Hi, Mr. Cooper. Hi. My son is a math teacher, Mr. Cooper. Sorry. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Really it's know. It's so far out. Coop. Coop is fun. Coop is fun. <laughs> we'll go there. Uh, so based on the previous two questions, I just want to play, play a little more into that. Do you think that corp the corporations are having way too much influence on the music that is being produced? And what do you think about the technology that's used? I mean, right now there's a lot of auto-tune that's used and instead of real musicianship. Yeah. Uh, which is true, but I, I think that happens a lot with your divas, 
you know, I think that happens a lot. It seems like to me, like the girls have taken over the showbiz part. I mean, if you go to see a Rihanna show, if you go to see a, you know, uh, any one of these girls, they do big shows, big productions, Pink, any of their great productions. The guys don't seem to do those big shows. I don't know why, but uh, you're right on one level that technology, I think, overshadows. I could take five people in this room and take them into a studio, and after I got done auto tuning, you guys would sound unbelievable. You wouldn't even believe how good you sounded. You know, now take those same five people and put them on stage in front of an audience. You're dead. <laughs> so, do you think that the music that's being produced today is very forgettable? It's it's very disposable. I mean, I listen and I try. I honestly try to like everything. And I'm sitting there and I will listen to a song and I'll go, who who is that? Well, I can tell that that's, you know, Whitney. But the song is exactly the same song I heard five minutes ago from another girl that's trying to sound like Britney. So you're getting such disposable music out there. Name me a classic in the last five years. A song that's gonna live for 50 years. I can name you a, a hundred of them from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So I think it's the songwriting, and I think it's the fact that those, those artists back then meant it. So, so, uh, so 100, 200 years from now, what do you think people will be listening to? What will we consider music? Don't know. That's a very good question. I think, but I think that being human, we're always going to want to hear a great song. I and you know, <coughs> yeah. I, I listen. I even listen to electronic music and stuff like that, just to, to get a variation. And it always comes back to how good is the song? Why does Cole Porter still work? Why does Burt Bacharach's music still work for every generation? Because it's so well written. And it's that, that lyric is married to that chord, and it's perfect the way it's written. That's how I learned. I used to listen to Burt Bacharach. Yeah, as crazy as that sounds. And lyrically, I'd listen to Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry was the best lyricist of all time. If he couldn't think of a word, he'd make one up. Yeah. <laughs> he said, don't give me no botheration. <laughs> the next time we play Scrabble, put botheration down. Let's see, see what happens. <laughs> the, the, the Cool Raider was filled. Cool Raider. Yeah. You know, well. But that was so perfect, the way that he would tell a story in three minutes. And you could visualize everything that happened in that story. Yeah. Chuck Berry was probably the best lyricist of all time. If you can get that lyric married to a great... I'll tell you how this works. I have my wife and my two daughters. If I'm writing a ballad, like Only Women Bleed, or You and Me, and all those things, I found that there's one point in that song where the lyric should break the girl's heart. And if that lyric hits right on the right chord, you're going to hear, oh. <laughs> I would play the song for my daughters and my wife, and I'd sit there, and I'd sit there, and it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And I'd hear, oh. And I'd go, yes! <laughs> got it! Got it! Because it builds up to something, and you're picturing, you're picturing, then you go, and you, you break the girl's heart right there. And you, oh. Oh. And you go, that's what, that's going to be a hit. Yeah, thank you. That was a great question. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Let's go over here. We have time for about three or four more questions. So. Hi, Alice. Huge fan. Thank you. Um, I've noticed since uh, Welcome to My Neighbor and before that, you've gone through so many stylistic changes from uh, Welcome to My Nightmare, Flesh the Fashion, Brutal Planet, even uh, Trash. Yeah. Where would you say Alice Cooper is going? from where we are now, and how have these changes affected you? It, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing, because I started working with my original band, like, uh, Neil and Mike, and I started writing some songs with them, and Dennis. And when you try to capture a 1973 sound, or 72 sound, it's almost impossible to go back to that era and capture it. You have to remember, at those times, we were basically starving. 
we were in a house, <clears throat> you know, living on nothing, writing songs, and it was everybody's input, and all of a sudden, this magical song came out. Everybody now <clears throat> has become better singers, better players. It's hard to go back and devolve <laughs> and try to create that simplicity again. We tried it, and we sit there and we went, it's, it's almost impossible. You know, if you told Paul McCartney to go back and write a Beatles song from 1963, I don't know if he could, because John wouldn't be there, and George wouldn't be there, you know? So the influences around it are saying, I'm, gonna, I'm taking the next album and making it a retro on a, on a lineup, more like Killer, because that's basic rock and roll, Detroit rock and roll, you know? But the simplicity is what's hard. It's not the complicated part. It's the simplicity that's hard to get. Thank you. Great question. Thank right. you. Thank you all. You know, Hi, Alice. Hi. You have a little something on. Uh, <laughs> nice try. <laughs> what would be the most craziest thing you've done on stage? Oh, Can you see, pick what, just one? What week would that be? <laughs> You know, the guillotine is only misses me by that much. It's a 40 pound blade. And I was taught how to do this by Amazing Randy, who was like a great magician. In order for it to look really good, you have to let it get really close. And you have to know what you're doing up there. Don't try this at home, by the way, if you have guillotines at home. <laughs> I'm sure some of you do. Uh, it, it took me a lot of practice to get this thing so, I mean, first of all, the, the, it missed me by that much. And then, it, and, that's, uh, and, the, and the closer it got, the more the audience reacted to it. I always like the element in my show of when I'd go to the circus and I'd see a guy on a wire, and I'd go, he could actually fall. Yeah. There's a guy in a tiger's cage with a chair. And I'd go, this tiger's probably looking at this chair going, <laughs> I could kill this guy in a second. And I, and everybody in the audience knows that. I like the idea of a little bit of element of danger in the show where the audience, well, what if the guillotine actually does cut his head off tonight? What if he actually does get hung? You know, that needs to be in the show. That needs to be in there. I mean, we could put a rubber blade there, but that wouldn't be fun for me. They're always telling me, no, you use rubber swords. Like, what? I've got Errol Flynn's sword here. You know, I mean, I actually have Errol Flynn's sword I use on stage. I'm not going to put that down for a rubber sword. If you get cut, you get cut. It's rock and roll. Come on. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing that did happen to me, though, once that I wasn't expecting. And usually everything is planned. I, this same Errol Flynn sword. Okay. I've got to show you this. It's fog going on and lights and everything. And I used to take this sword and stick it in the ground and walk away. Well, one of these things I went... Oh shit. <laughs> right through there, came right out here. Right through my leg. Oh my god. And I took my hand off and it went <laughs> spurting blood like this. I happened to be anesthetized a little bit at the time. <laughs> so I wasn't feeling it that much and I went, once it was in there, I went, well, it was pretty good. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm walking around the stage like this and the band knows it's an accident and they're going, Oh, thanks. <laughs> There's little puddles of blood everywhere. <laughs> Finally, pull it out. Oh, oh my God. God. And I around and I finish the show. And, you know, when you're on stage, your adrenaline's going crazy. You don't yeah. feel any of that. Yeah. If you got a headache, it doesn't matter what. You're, you're going. And I finish the show. Thank you. And I go back to you. Ah! <laughs> oh, oh, so the next wow. thing, and you know, I'm needle-phobic to start with. They said, we we got to get a tetanus shot. I went, oh, no. I took a bottle of whiskey and poured it. So I figured that's what James Bond would do. I poured it down there and I wrapped it up. And I couldn't walk. I mean, for the next 23 hours, I was just like, as soon as I got on stage, <laughs> Thank also, you. I love you. I love your music. Can I hug you? Yes, yeah, sure. Of course. Aww. All right. Why well, not? Uh, and then here's what we're going to do. While she gets her hug, we're going to take one question here, one question here, and then we uh, we got to call it. So that was sweet. So we're going to take a picture for her. Uh, 
She reminds me of my daughter. That guy you're going out with doesn't like him. You look great. High five. You look awesome. All right. Okay, so we're going to go over here quickly and then we'll take the last question. It's weird, she's 55 years old. She really kept really well. Hi, go ahead. Hi, Oz. Well, first thing is that I love your song, School's Out. Um, last year, me and my friends, we pulled a prank on our teachers, and it was, uh, we hit a, a uh, portable speaker, and he blasted that song, and the teachers had went crazy about it, we were all laughing, and we just went crazy about it. Um, it's, it's generally played almost every last day of school, almost at every school. Uh, and the teachers say, this is more our song than kids. <laughs> By now, we hate every kid in the school. <laughs> but my question is for you, where do you see yourself in five years? I'll still be doing this. <laughs> but uh, I'll be sitting there in a room with her. He'll have a couple seasons of that show where he teaches people to write lyrics <laughs> under his belt. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, last question. Hi. First time with this one? Yes. Um, with the Hollywood Vampires. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. But are you going to be doing any more solo concerts, like when you went to Foxwoods on Halloween for your Halloween shows? Yeah, oh, yeah, we just finished uh, six months of my own show, my, my regular show. Oh. And a night, not a night with Alice, Spend the Night with Alice Cooper, it's called. Oh, okay. And uh, that's, we've already booked into next year. We're already got 200 shows booked for next year. So, and that's amazing. And we can put it right on from the right now. Yes. <laughs> All right, you know what? Find him afterward. Are you gonna? All right. No, if I were a guy in the audience, I'd be asking her for a hug. Come on. <laughs> Jeez, are you guys nuts? All right, this is the last time. Right, get over here, bro. All right. She does. All right, you guys. Thank you. My wife didn't see that. You